Thank you, President Paul. Our speaker today is Patricia McConnell. She received a PhD in zoology from the UW-Madison, and she is a certified applied animal behaviorist emeritus. Dr. McConnell is committed to improving the relationship between people and animals. She is known worldwide to be an expert on canine and feline behavior and dog training. She has consulted with pet owners for over 30 years about serious behavioral problems. She taught the biology and philosophy of human-animal relationships at the UW-Madison for 25 years. She co-hosted Calling All Pets with Larry Mailer on WPR for 14 years, and she has spoken around the world about canine behavior and training. She is an author and was also the behavior columnist for The Bark Magazine, which is the New Yorker of dog magazines. And she also writes for many other publications. The title of her speech today is Treat Everyone Like a Dog. We look forward to her presentation, and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thanks for speaking to us today. I also want to mention that we will have a Q&A with our speaker at the end as time allows, but please wait for the microphone if you have a question. So let's welcome Dr. McConnell to our podium. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hang on. Um, thank you, Janet, for asking me. Thank you, Jane, for arrangements. Thanks to um, Dave and Ettinger Surgical Options for sponsorship. It is, it is great fun to be here. I, I am going to introduce by saying there's something going on with my brain. We don't know what. Heart, lung, I don't know. We don't know. But in a few minutes, I'm going to sit down if it's OK better than you having to pick me up off the floor, which was very dramatic. And you know, people, parrots, and chimps love drama. But we'll just pass on that, possibly today. But while I'm standing here, um, I want to tell you why I came up with a title, Treat Everyone Like a Dog. It's, it's the title of one of my favorite books that I did not write. You know, I've written a lot of books about um, not just dog training, but relationships between people and dogs, emotions, trauma, comparative in people and dogs. This was written by Dr. Karen London, colleague and friend, and it is not about dogs, and it's not about training dogs. It's about how to use the science that we know that influences the behavior of those around us. How, how does, what does science have to tell us about how we can influence the behavior of others around us? Let me start by telling you a story. I'm actually, I'm, I'm okay. I have a podium here, so I'm good. So I'm going to stand here for a minute. So I'm going to start by telling you a story. Um, and it's a story about um, 25 or so years ago when I was starting to date my now husband. And we were sort of flush in you know, the new relationship. Both of us had been out of relationship for quite a while. And I was just all sort of like, you get, you know? And, and I was just wanting to like email him and just, you know, hi, you know, how you doing? But he warned me. He said, I want you to know my ex-wife complained bitterly about the fact that I can be so sort of single focused, you know, she, they worked in the same building, she could walk by me, I wouldn't notice her, she would email me, I wouldn't answer her, so I just want you to know. I was like, okay, got it, noted, but you know, I was in that first flush and I thought, you know, I'd sort of like to be able to, so I thought, okay, I know what to do. So I would send him an inconsequential email, you know, hey babe, how you doing? Didn't matter, right, if he answered or not. And most of the time, he would not. So nine out of 10 times, he would not answer. I said nothing, nothing. But the 10th time, he answered. And I immediately, because I'm checking, answered back. <laughs> and I would say something like, hmm, I cannot wait to see you tonight. <laughs> so what was I doing? You know what I was doing. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I was using positive reinforcement, right? <laughs> Which is a profoundly powerful and the most effective way to influence the behavior of everybody around us. But it's not as simple as just giving your dog a cookie when you ask him to sit. It's actually pretty complicated if you really want to get into the weeds. 
And so one example for, for one example of, of one of the complications, or one of the things that's important to know, is that re positive reinforcement is always defined by the receiver, right? So with, with my husband, Jim Billings, it was easy. <laughs> he was, we were in a new relationship. He was a healthy American man who hadn't been in a relationship in a long time. There was no question. I was pretty sure what would be a good positive reinforcement. But it's not always so easy. What it, you know, so, so here's an example from actually a dog training class. When I started doing classes, dog training classes for Dog's Best Friend, the business that, that I started many years ago, um, sold it quite a few years ago too, still going strong, I'm proud to say. So when we would have recall exercises, calling your dog to come, we would set it up in the, in the later stages, in the later weeks, to be really tough. So that, you know, there was food on the ground, there were all these distractions, right? And so I would ask the other owners, we have one person to come up, let her dog loose at the other end of the room, all kinds of distractions. And then I'd say, I want all the rest of you to decide what it, how to, whether she does a good job or not reinforcing her dog when her dog comes. And so the dog came every time. Dog would come, owner would be like, good dog, good dog. Good dog, good dog. And you'd ask the other owners, uh, how did she do? And they were like, great, that was fantastic. And then I asked them, what did the dog do? And there might be one person who would say, uh, the dog turned his head away, went and walked away. That was positive punishment. Adding something into the system to decrease the behavior. You just taught your dog not to come when you called. Because they don't like it. They don't like being patted on the head. It's the way it's, people in zoos who work with wolves or people who work with wolves, that one of the ways they get wolves to go away is they pat them on the head. Somebody patted me on the head once, and, and his description was, your eyes got sort of murderous. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? So, so you know, no, no, knowing what is, is reinforcing is incredibly important in everything we do. You, I think you all know far better than I do the, the research out there that at a, after a certain point, giving somebody a raise is far less effective than giving them agency, than giving them skin in the game, right? So people are getting raises when that's not what they wanted. So thinking about what is reinforcing for anybody, whether it's your family, whether it's in a workplace, is really, really critical, and it's very often misunderstood. Um, again, the, 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 the receiver defines what is reinforcing. There is more, and I love this part. Um, there is a uh, wonderful neuroscientist, he's since passed away, named Jak Ponskep. He did decades of research on the neurobiology of emotions. And he was particularly interested in these studies in dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter associated with the pleasure, pleasure centers of your brain. It's highly involved in addiction, for example, tragically, right? Um, the, the people, individuals, mammals, are highly motivated, highly motivated to get a hit of dopamine. So in the study that he did, classic kind of experimental study, I think it was rats. So the study, there was, there was a rat, buzzer went off, meaning you can now press lever, levers in a, some kind of order, and if you get the order right, you get the best food in the world. So you would expect when they got that food that their dopamine levels would increase, right? Well, they do, but not as much as they did when the buzzer went off, right? What, what Panske found out is that it's, it's the anticipation. He called it seeking, a seeking. He, he, he defines it as a separate emotion, seeking. And, and so, so when I said, mm, can't wait to see you, <laughs> right? So keep that in mind, because what it turns out is that the anticipation of something really good is highly, highly motivating. But it can't be something you expect to get 100% of the time. So if you give your employees a bonus every year, 
same amount, or maybe you know, up with inflation, it loses its power. There has to be a kind of anticipation of what's going to happen. I don't know. It has to be variable reinforcement. Which is why, before I'm done with this talk, somebody here is going to get reinforced for some reason by someone, somehow, and I'll just leave it at that. There's another, how am I doing? There, there's, there's another aspect of positive reinforcement that can be really problematic. So one is accidental reinforcement. And it happens, my, my favorite example, and those of you, I have a few of you have dogs, I'm guessing. <laughs> so my favorite example is barking. I have to tell you, I am not a fan of barking. It's one of the behaviors of my best friends that I like the least. I am super sound sensitive. I do not like barking. And, and I'm not alone, right? There are a lot of people who don't like barking. Domestic dogs bark a lot. Some of them weigh more than others. By the way, I should just parenthetically put in here, because we're talking about, about barking. One of, one, I, we have two Border Collies. Jim and I have two Border Collies, Skip and Maggie. Um, Skip never barks, ever. Ever. Bless him. <laughs> Bless him. By the way, he's from Ireland. I should just mention. He was imported from Ireland. Um, but, but OK, barking. So your dog is barking. Ginger. Ginger, be quiet. Quiet. Ginger. Right? Barking is a social phenomena in domestic dogs that is contagious and is reinforcing. So every time you yell at your dog for barking, you have just reinforced it. <laughs> right? It's really easy to do. And we do it all the time um, accidentally. And here's, here's, I think, the most common, common problem. I have it too. I am the first to tell you. It's about timing. How many people have a dog who begs to be petted? Right? How many people have a dog who like slaps their paw on your lap? Right? And, and how many people, hand is still up, um, how, how many people say, that's enough, and then turn away, and then eventually, not too long from, you know, start petting their dog? Right? <laughs> right? So, and, and think of it, how many of us have an employee who, oh, I don't know, maybe you have a colleague who is sort of constantly pestering you, and you sort of put them off, and you put them off, and you put them off, and you say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll work on your project with you, even though you don't want to. Or a child, you know, you have a son who wants tickets to a, a, a concert, and you're like, no, we can't afford it, no, I don't want you to, no, no, fine, okay. <laughs> Request number seven, right, you say, okay, right? You have just created incredibly powerful persistence <laughs> and resistance to extinction. So if an, if an individual animal, whether human or four-legged or two-legged birds, learns that if they ask for something once, nothing, twice, nothing, three times, nothing, four times, nothing, five times, they get, they, they get a reinforcement. They're like, OK, I know, I've learned. I got it. I have to do it five times. <laughs> OK. And if then the next time it's eight times, they're like, stamina is the name of the game. I'm not going to give up here. I got it. I got it. And it's really hard to get out of it, right? But it's really powerful, because all the research shows not only do you teach an individual to just keep at it, but when you look at extinguishing that behavior, do you know what I mean by that? So um, basically, when you extinguish a behavior, you just stop reinforcing it, period, end of sentence. And then you look at how long it takes to go away. Um, there's even something called extinction behavior that relates to all of us, I'm sure. I love this example. Have you ever been to an elevator that just took forever? So you press it, nothing happens. You press it again, right? And then right before you walk away, have you ever gone, mm -hmm. Right? 
that's called extinction behavior. So often when you're trying to get a behavior to stop by not reinforcing it, there's a period of time where it gets way worse. And that's when animal trainers are like, yes, you're making progress. But it's really difficult because you think, I'm doomed. You know, this is never going to happen. So, so again, persistence and a lack of extinction. If you, if you don't decide, I'm not going to reinforce that. And again, I have a dog on a couch who knows exactly how many times <laughs> to beg me to pet her. OK. So there's another, there's another aspect um, of reinforcement. And I'm just, I'm just talking about positive reinforcement today, I, although there's going to be a little something at the end. Yeah, I think there's time. A little something at the end. And then I'll leave a little bit of time for questions about um, classical conditioning. But one, one other aspect of positive reinforcement is best described by what's called the PREMAC principle. PREMAC was, uh, I believe, a psychologist. And he his, his principle is very simple. It's basically that the most predictable behavior reinforces the least predictable behavior. It's sort of it's like, what? <laughs> All he's really saying is that it's, I'm circling back to what does the individual want, to what is really reinforcing. So I'll give you a really simple example. Um, when, when we got Skip, for example, um, he was three years old, a dog from Ireland, he was three years old, um, competition sheep herding dog. We have sheep on a farm, and I compete in sheep dog trials. Um, all, what he wants to do as much as almost anything is run to the barn, because that's where the sheep are. So when I got him, he opened the door, bang, he's out the door. Right, and he's gone, and he's just, he's so fast, he's like behind the barn before I can even stop it. So that was the most probable behavior, right? I knew if I opened the door, he would start running to the barn. That's the reinforcement. And that's what's really hard to do, is you sort of have to wrap your, round, your head around. The problem is the reinforcement. So I just simply taught him, if you pause one second, no, that's too long. Second in behavior is endless. If you pause for a microsecond, I would literally go, stand, OK. Stand, OK. Stand, OK. Right? And in a week, he just stand there until I said OK. Now, he might be dancing around. <laughs> but here's my favorite example. And again, this is from dogs, but you can all generalize it. Um, years ago, a long time ago, Friends were over, had a new border collie, young female, a bunch of friends were over, it's evening, we're sitting on the porch having a beer, and this dog comes up with one of those nasty, long dead birds in her mouth, it's just got an entire zoological park of things you don't want in it, right? And it was bad, right? And so I went to get it from her, and she looked at me, like this little look in her eye, and she took off. We're going to fly Chase. I love Chase, right? And so one of my friends said, I dare you. I bet you. I'll bet you can't get that out of that dog's mouth. And Locke was just like, well, OK. And I had to anyway, because I didn't want her eating this thing, because it was dangerous. So I went outside. I mean, I went down from the porch. I leaned towards her, and she did her little thing like that. And then I started running the other way. And I ran, and I ran, and I clapped, and I zigzagged, and I just, I got as interesting as I got. At one point, I threw myself on the ground, and I rolled over, and my friends are like, what, is she drunk? <laughs> you know, and, and, and then finally, she actually came to me, and eventually, she actually did drop it. I had something else in my hand, I think. She dropped it. What did I do to reinforce her? I gave it back. And my friends were like, what did you do? It just took you 15 minutes. And it did. It took a really long time. And I was exhausted. They said, what did you do? I said, that was the most probable behavior. That was what she wanted. So I gave it back to her. And then I did a little bit of this. And then I ran around for like just a minute this time and took it away from her. And in two weeks, she had a phenomenal drop at Q. OK? Again, you can generalize this to anything. So but before I um, answer some questions, the one last thing I just quickly want to mention, because I think it relates to this room, and it relates to so much of what we do, and it's about classical conditioning. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story that is, you're, you're going to wonder why I'm telling you this story. It's about dogs with a medical problem who are, be give, who are being given a medicine. 
There was a study done on these dogs. They were being given a medicine that worked. I think it was pain-related. I apologize. I honestly can't remember. But it was a medical problem that was fixed by this medicine. The experience was an experiment. And then, after a certain amount of time, they switched the medicine. So they did not have an active ingredient in it anymore. It was just a sugar pill. Dogs can't possibly be affected by the placebo effect, right? They don't expect it to help them, except it did. It had the same effect. Worked great. And the reason it worked great is because, well, some of the reasons why it worked great, because we don't really know everything, is that that pill was given at the same time of day, in the same room, with exactly the same method, same size pill, and I'm hoping, knowing what I do about dogs and cats, pilling a cat, is that it was exactly the same tablet, but just not the active ingredient. So why did it work? Classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is an incredibly powerful, powerful phenomenon. It has a huge effect on our behavior. And I'm just going to give you an example related to my work. I, as you know, as obviously I've said, um, I've written a lot. I've written a lot of books. I have now switched to writing fiction, which is like being on a different planet. It's very hard. It's very fun. It's very hard. The great thing about fiction is that anything can happen. And the horrible thing about fiction is that anything can happen. Right? Um, so I work on it in my study. My favorite room in our home is, my, is the study. It's beautiful. I have a beautiful desk. I have one of those big ass Macintosh monitors, you know. It's like a movie screen, right? And you know what I do there? Work on my novel. Period. End of sentence. I am not allowed to do anything. The only email I can answer in there, because how often have you been like, oh, I don't know what to say in this next paragraph. I'll just check my email, right? I can only check email if it's about the book. I can only go online, or you know, I can only go on Google if it's about the book. I can't do anything, anything else in that room. So there are many, many days where I'm in there for an hour, or half an hour, or not at all. And it's my favorite room in the house, because I've classically conditioned myself to write that kind of work in that room. And that brings me to this room, because I, I was telling Paul, my dad was a banker. And, and part of what I loved about my dad and his job was how invested his bank was in the community, um, which is something I think a lot of people don't realize. And this room, to me, is about community, you know? And, and I, would, I would bet you a lot that there is a lot of oxytocin <laughs> and a lot of dopamine in this room because you've all classically conditioned yourself to come to the same place with the same people, with the same, you know, structure in the best of all possible ways. So, I would, you know, I don't know how much people in business think about how is your workspace used? How do you use your space, you know? How do you, how can you use classical conditioning in the simplest of ways to make your life better? Because that's what all this is about, is understanding the science behind behavior to make your life better. And once you understand the basic principles, you can not only influence your son, you know, or your daughter, or your husband, or the hardest individual of all to train, which is yourself. So, thank you. Happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sit. I think there's time for a few questions, but I'm gonna... Karen? Oh, do I? No, you have a mic. Thank you. I need to learn so much more. <laughs> I am not a dog person. I like dogs so much that I don't have one because I wouldn't be willing to give them all the care they deserve. Then I would say you are a dog person. Thank you. <clears throat> My sister-in-law is a love me, love my dogs person, and her dogs are unruly. 
and I struggle every time I am around them and her. Mm -hmm. Any advice? Yeah, no, that's, I love that question. I love that question. So this is your sister, sister-in-law? Sister-in-law, what's, what's her, what does she love? What does she love? So, so, okay, anything else? She's, she said, probably more than her husband, certainly more than her sibs. <laughs> so I guess, you know, thinking as quickly as I possibly could, not knowing this woman, which would really help. I mean, the more you know her, the more it helps, right? But, but one thing I would think about is try, you know, what is, it, they're, they're sort of one of two things. If the dogs are not in the room, how can you reinforce your sister-in-law? Are there moments, or could you influence the dogs? That's what I do, frankly. No, it's not, it might not be as hard as you think. I have to tell you, I have dear friends who just got a new two-year-old Springer Spaniel who was a wild woman, basically. Um, and they were exhausted, absolutely exhausted. Because they were constantly working with this dog. The dog barked if she wasn't getting attention. She was crazy, high energy. And I said, can we just sit here and ignore the dog for a minute and see what happens? Dog, now I'm not saying this is gonna happen to you, but the dog went in the crate and went to sleep, right? So, so one thing to do is you and your husband sit down, figure out what, it, what, is, what is the unruly part? You know, what is it that bothers you so much? And then think about what you do want. And then find, it's called, it's called um, both shaping and capturing. So say they're, you know, they're idiots at the door, right? They're just idiots at the door. They're jumping all over you. And then the second one gets its, down on, its feet all down on the ground. You're like, good. You give it a treat, okay? So, so that 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 might be the easiest thing to do because I don't know your sister well enough to know how you could use reinforcement. So, good luck. I, that that is a very common, um, very common question to advice columnists. By the way, <laughs> you are not alone. So, I'm I'm just going to go until somebody tells me. I know it's really important. Oh, it's 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 one o'clock. So if I'm supposed to stop now, please somebody tell me. Oh, 105, okay, I'm very, very focused on never going over. Okay, so another question? I know that wasn't a perfect answer, but it's a start anyway. I'll get there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I could at least meet you. Here you go. <laughs> oh. So since you brought up barking. One, one moment. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I can't come up. Can you come up here, the woman in the green jacket with the beautiful hair? Can you come up for a moment? Me? Yeah. Yeah. With my microphone? Would, would you like a copy of this book? Would it be something you would enjoy? Would I like it? Of yeah. course. Well, thank you. Are you showing some behavior? I am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Reinforcement tip being on the microphone so, committee. Exactly. My first question is really for Susan, if I can borrow that book when you're done with it. <laughs> so since you brought up barking, I'm going to ask the question that probably is the most common that you get. So my dog does not bark except when she goes out in the backyard. Mm, okay. She goes out back. She loves to bark, 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 bark until okay. she's done and she comes back in. Okay. I cannot figure out what is motivating her, what's interesting about barking outside. When we go out for a walk uh, together, she doesn't good. bark. Good, good. And she doesn't bark in the house all that she much? She doesn't bark in the house. Good. Unless we're like running in the house. Which, right, she you gets know, that's, aroused. That's not allowed. Um, but you just, you just nailed it. You just answered your question. Arousal. She goes outside, and you just let her out by herself? Yeah. So... Possibly two things. One is she's just aroused. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? And I'm the kind of thing that just gets really noisy when I get excited. There are a lot of dogs that like that. What kind of dog is she? Mix? She's a, well, then, <laughs> she's a Maltese mix. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I love them, by the way, but they can be a little, a little vocal. Oh, yes. um, so arousal, but it also might partly be a kind of a fear or anxiety. I'm a little tiny dog out here and my human pack is way inside the house and I'm here all alone. You know, barking, as best we understand it, evolved from wolves who bark very rarely. Wolves very rarely bark. Adolescent wolves bark the most. 
which fits because dogs are somewhat more like adolescent wolves than adult wolves, which is why they don't rip our throats out every morning. Um, but so I'm guessing it's a combination of arousal and a little bit of fear. So I would, st if, it, if she was my dog, I wouldn't just let her out. I would go out with her. And you might not like that, Wisconsin. I mean, my cues, my, but, but, but I will tell you, given Wisconsin, I mean, I always, I never let my dogs loose, ever, um, without me being there. But my cue for going potty number two in Wisconsin is hurry up. <laughs> so, I, so, I mean, I think she's a little scared out there. She's calling the pack. That's, and that's why adolescent wolves do it. They're calling their pack mates. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Wow, thank you, Dr. McCannell. Oh, fantastic. I just had to close my eyes sometimes and I could hear your voice. That was just fantastic to be there. So, um, isn't it great to be a Rotarian, right? You get to hear incredible programs like this. Um, fantastic. Really appreciate you coming out today. And um, so, um, Dr. McConnell's got an uh, appointment after this, so unfortunately she'd love to sit and talk to people, but she needs to get to her appointment. So um, please respect that for her so she can um, not be late for her next appointment. So thank you. Um, I hope that you join us next week when our program is going to be the mayoral candidate forum. Um, always very interesting, so I hope that you come out for that. And with that, um, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>